Chapter 2 is entitled The Environment and Ethics. I'm going to teach most of what's in this chapter, but not in the order that it's presented in the textbook. I'm going to basically start in the middle, so uh, things are going to be not in the same order as, as your authors present it. So box 2.2 .2 is where I'm going to begin on ethical theories. This is just a brief overview of m main sorts of ways that people think about ethics and we're asking questions about ethics here because we're wondering what kind of obligation society has let's say to pollution victims or especially to people who live in future generations because we know lots of environmental problems have a component of intergener intergenerational equity which is raised by these problems. So we're going to discuss three main types of ethical theories, a consequentialist, non-consequentialist, and contractarian. So let's start with consequentialist. The book uh, the book calls the consequentialist uh, type of theory a, a teleological theory. Uh, let me define it first and then I'll get back to explaining why it's called consequentialist or teleological. A somewhat superficial way of describing this ethical theory is that the ends justify the means. In other words, the means, namely the actions that you take, are not to be judged as good or bad in and of themselves. Instead, you look at what kind of consequences they have, the, the ends, and then if they have good, if an action has a good consequence, then it's judged to be ethical, and if an action has a bad consequence, it's judged to be unethical. So you can't pass judgment on the rightness of an action without considering its consequences. A prime example of a consequentialist ethical theory is utilitarianism. And uh, now I was going to say most neoclassical economics is utilitarian, but there's an important distinction to make. Most neoclassical economics um, thinks of individuals' behavior as being utilitarian. In other words, individuals are motivated to maximize utility. But utilitarianism for a society is something different. It's that the end, that is the what's desirable, is the sum of the utility of the individuals in in a society. And I guess it's better to say the sum of the utilities of the individuals in a society. And neoclassical economics doesn't necessarily ascribe to this form of utilitarianism. Now, calling this idea consequentialist makes sense because it focuses on the consequences of actions, not on the intrinsic nature of the actions per se. Teleological is an English word, but it comes from the Greek. Teleos means the end as in the, the purpose of an action. And so again, this makes sense. Uh, tele tele teleological theory is one that asks what is the f final consequence of an action and then decides whether the action is good or bad based on that consequence. A very different ethical theory is non-consequentialist, also called deontological, not in this text, but in others, and in this text it's called uh, rights theory. A non-consequentialist position is that actions can be judged as being right or wrong irrespective of their consequences. Let's take an example. Is This is the so-called ticking time bomb example. The police have captured a terrorism suspect in the middle of New York City. And he has planted a bomb that is going to go off and kill a lot of people. 
And suppose, now in the real life, this is a highly questionable supposition, but just suppose that if the police tortured the suspect, the suspect would tell them where the bomb is located and it could be defused without killing anybody. Whereas if the police don't torture the person, then the bomb is going to go off and kill people. Question, should police torture the person? A consequentialist might say yes, because torture is bad, but killing a whole bunch of people is much worse. And if the consequence of torture is to hurt the suspect to some extent, but to save the lives of lots of people, then torture is justified. A non-consequentialist might say torture is bad, which means the torture is bad, which means the torture is bad. We don't have to investigate what the consequences are doing one thing versus another. We have a non-consequentialist uh, position that torture is bad, and that's all you need to know. Uh, uh, let me just illustrate another uh, much more f famous example of a non-consequentialist position. What I have on the screen now are the, uh, here, let me, the uh, Ten Commandments from the Hebrew Bible, also called the Old Testament. And you can s now, there are different uh, numberings in different religious traditions. And th this is a short form uh, of, uh, uh, of these. So this is just a summary. Uh, some of the commandments are quite long. Some of them are actually just about as short as what you see here. But the point is that these are non-consequentialist. Um, the one that's labeled number eight here says, uh, you, sh you should not steal. It doesn't say you should not steal under the following circumstances, but if circumstances are different, then stealing is okay. It simply says you should not steal. So this is an example of a non-consequentialist moral position. Okay, so that's non-consequentialism. Uh, these are, the co consequentialists and non-consequentialists are very old. A contractarian moral position is uh, very new. It was essentially invented by a Harvard philosopher named John Rawls, who published a book about it in 1971 called Theory of Justice. Rawls said, it's too hard to answer the question, what does a just society look like? by sitting down in your office and trying to think about it yourself. So Rawls wasn't trying to do that. At least he didn't, at least he said that that's not he, what he was trying to do. What he was trying to do instead was to come up with a method by which society could come up with the rules of a just society. So he wasn't, Rawls wasn't going to say what a just society looked like. But how would you go about, in theory, uh, coming up with a description of a just society? And he starts with a with an idea which is which certainly can't be done in practice. But he was interested in working through the well the theory <laughs> behind this idea. Uh, it starts with this notion of a veil of ignorance. So he said, suppose you gather everybody who is a member of the society into something like a constitutional convention. It, the, the problem with that in the real world is that people come with their own prejudices and life histories. So some people are men, and they might be prejudiced against women. Some people are old, and they might be prejudiced against young people, and, and, and so forth and so on. Everybody has their own identity that they bring into such a constitutional convention. So Rawls imagined, suppose you could hold such a constitutional convention, but when people entered the doors, they forgot th who they were in the outside world. They forgot whether they were male or female. They forgot whether they were young and old. They forgot whether they were rich or poor. They forgot whether they were a member of a certain religion or a certain eth ethnic or racial group. And during the entire time that they're writing the rules for a just society, they don't know who they are in real life. After the rules are written, 
the Constitutional Convention is over and they have to go out into the real world again and live with the rules that they've made. So that was Rawls's first contribution, was to suggest that this kind of mechanism would give rise to the rules of a just society. He, however, did not stop there. He decided to speculate on what such a constitutional convention would come up with. And this, I think, is a more controversial part of John Rawls's work. He thought that, to use economic language, people are basically risk averse. And one can criticize this and say maybe it's actually John Rawls who is basically risk averse. But in any case, his point was, or, or, or what he felt, was that people are basically risk averse. And so if they have a choice between a, a society that's characterized by a lot of income inequality or a society that's characterized by a lot of income equality, Rawls thought that this constitution written under the veil of ignorance would support uh, a society with a lot of equality because people would worry that when they left the constitutional convention it would turn out that they were one of the poor people and so they would so that so within the constitutional convention they would want to try to perhaps maximize the welfare of the poorest person in society or at least pay a lot of attention to the welfare of the poorest person in society now, Rawls might be wrong about this. There are certainly some people who like to gamble, who like uncertainty. Uh, there, might pe there might be people who would want to have a society, write rules so that society would have a whole lot of inequality, hoping that when they left the Constitutional Convention, it would turn out that they would be one of the really rich people. And knowing, of course, that they might also end up being one of the really poor people, but wanting to take that chance versus living in a society where everybody had more or less the same wealth or the same income. Now Rawls and either all philosophers or almost all philosophers consider justice a question uh, that concerns just one generation, intragenerational justice. In other words, the position of philosophers, at least academic philosophers, has been that the notion of justice is a notion of relationship between people who are alive at the same time. But with environmental problems and with some other kinds of economic problems, the question is can we apply this to inter intergenerational questions? And would a theory of justice type argument under the veil of ignorance lead to intergenerational equality. John Rawls explicitly said he wasn't talking about intergenerational questions, but economists started very quickly after the publication of Rawls's book applying his ideas to intergenerational questions. And if you agree with Rawls that a convention would be very concerned about the welfare of the worst off people in society, then it naturally leads you to at least speculate that, that this would lead to intergenerational equality. That though raises the question, equality of what exactly? And I want to highlight three possibilities here, one, two, and three. The first one is perhaps the most obvious, equality of utility, or well-being. So you would define here intergenerational equality as ha saying that all generations have the same utility. However, some people suggest a better notion would be equality of opportunity. Uh, your your book here in box uh, 2.2 talks about resourcism, which is capacity for capacity for well-being. So this is an idea that we give all res all generations 
equal resources so that they have equal capacity for well-being, equal capacity for generating utility, but whether they actually use the resources wisely and generate a lot of utility or not is totally up to them. So here a maybe a lazy generation or a generation which for a level of consumption that makes some generations really happy uh, they think is sort of beneath them and so it's uh, they have very high standards and so the same level of consumption that let's say made their grandparents generation perfectly happy that doesn't make them happy because well let's say they're spoiled um, under this opportunity idea we don't have an ethical obligation if you even if you want all generations to be equal to make them equally happy as you as is equally happy as their grandparents. We just have an obligation to give them the same resources that their grandparents have. And if their grandparents were happy with those small amount of resources and this generation isn't because they think it's not good enough for them, we don't care about that. So that that's this the second idea that we have equality of opportunity, not equality of utility. Uh, this does give rise though to a technical question. Um, if you want to give all generations equal resources uh, all resources how about exhaustible resources we can't give all generations I equal amount of exhaustible resources unless we think about the earth ending in finite time and so you have a finite number of years before the human species ends but other than that if you think about an infinite amount of time then of course you can't take an exhaustible resource and spread it equally across an infinite amount of time so that's a problem there with can we even do this? We'll, we'll talk about this to, uh, to to some extent in a different in uh, in a future chapter. Um, whether whether you can trade off some resources for others, so that yeah, maybe you don't have as much exhaustible resources, but if you have enough other kind of resources, maybe that makes up for the lack of exhaustible resources. So you kind of have a an aggregate index of resources, which in this example would be equal for all generations. So. Uh, maybe um, maybe we can do it that way. The last thing here I wanted to point out, this last idea, is um, utility for the worst off. So maybe, well, I'm not talking here just about utility of the worst off generation, but within a generation, maybe you just care about the utility of the worst off person. This is very similar to the kind of conclusion that Rawls himself came to that what we really want to care about is the worst off person. And so this this would extend that idea intergenerationally, so we'd want to care about the worst off person through time. In terms of thinking how to actually implement intergenerational equity, there is a problem of non-identity as the book discusses on pages 35 and 36. And that is, we don't know the size of the population in the future. And, and in fact, we can decide, based on our current actions, how big future populations are going to be, at least to some extent. So let's say, how do we judge the loss of utility of a person who could be alive in, let's say, three generations from now, but when we're deciding that they're at, that that person is actually not going to be alive because of some decision that we make. Uh, if they don't exist, if they don't have any identity, then uh, do we take their loss of utility into account? Do we count that loss of utility as being zero because the person actually doesn't exist? Or we could even count it as infinite because the person never gets a chance to exist? So that's a question about that's generated because of uncertainty about the size of the human population in the future. Okay, I think I'll stop here, and uh, we'll, the the next point will be: uh, Does society even need an ethical theory? We'll uh, talk about that in the next video.